and uh, his wife were here in 96. <laughs> were any of you here in 96? Oh, okay. Well, lovely to see you. <laughs> and, uh, and I've also been at this couple of times since you've been here. So it's great to be here. Now, I would really appreciate... Have you got Bibles in the pews? Do you have... I'd, I'd be very grateful if you could. Um, if you could take your Bible and turn to the reading, which was Exodus chapter 4, because we're going to look at that in a few minutes, the story about Moses and the, uh, the excuses he makes when God calls him to, to do a work for him. Now, I want to start by just um, telling you about... Uh, before I came to work in Vancouver, I worked in a church in the middle of Edinburgh. Some of you will know Edinburgh. It was a church just off Princes Street. And uh, one day I was there with the staff, and a chap, he was a, a rough, rough guy. He was uh, uh, from Leith, uh, the docks in Edinburgh, and were in a place called Leith. And uh, he came in and he, he said, I need to talk to the, to the vic, we're called vicars in Britain. I need to talk to the vicar. And I got to chat to him, and uh, he was in a great deal of uh, trouble. He was, a, he was a robber, he was a gangster. Uh, he used to hold up people with a balaclava on his head and a, he had a little little gun, sawn off gun that he used. So he used to uh, rob people in, in the high street. Of, uh, so he was on the run. He, he, he was not only that, he was also a drug dealer. He'd go down to London and he'd get heroin and then he'd deal it on the streets of Leith. He was, he, I, I, I wouldn't say it's an alcoholic, but he was on that way. He was, he drank a lot, and he was hugely in debt, and, and he was homeless. So he was a sort of a real difficult sort of guy. Anyway, I got to know him, and started to befriend him, and he started to come a bit to the church, and he would rob, a, rob us. He'd steal the uh, PA equipment, and uh, <laughs> I remember he stole a computer one day, I was really angry about that. And, uh, uh, and really, he... And eventually, actually, my wife and I invited him to live with us. I don't know why we did that. <laughs> and uh, even though he was a gangster and a rough guy, he's absolutely terrified of my wife, if you met my wife. <laughs> she's a strong lady. She's a strong lady. And, uh, and, and he grew up with the family. He got to know our twin boys, who are now 30. And, uh, uh, and, and eventually, we had a chap called John Wimber who came to, uh, to Edinburgh. And... I learned all about, um, now this is going to sound pretty weird, uh, casting out demons. And I had a feeling that this guy actually had some demons in him. And I'd never done this before, and I won't go into it all now, but I actually cast out five demons from his life. It was an extraordinary, he went right up in the air when I cast them out and collapsed in front of me. And he started to make progress as a, spir a spiritual. He'd ask Christ to forgive him. He'd ask Christ. We prayed for him to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that he could uh, turn his back on his old life. And then I left uh, Edinburgh just as he was beginning to grow, and I headed off to Vancouver where I worked with Craig and Holly. And um, and then I was here for uh, four or five years, and then I went back to Edinburgh, and I was uh, back to York to work. And I was invited to lead a mission at the University of Edinburgh with InterVarsity. And I went to preach in my old church. And who was the verger? <laughs> who was meeting everybody? Who was looking after all the money? <laughs> who was locking the silver away? <laughs> well, you guessed. And I thought of that text that we had in Philemon. Do you remember what Paul said about Onesimus? Formerly, he was useless. But now, he has become really useful. And I thought, he's just like Onesimus. Onesimus, who was a runaway slave, became the bishop. Now, that hasn't happened yet. He became a bishop. Formerly useless, but now really useful for Christ. And I want to think for a few minutes with you about how we can be really useful. 
useful to God because God wants us to be useful to him. And my vicar in London, John Stott, he wrote this. He said, there is no higher honour that can be imagined than to be an instrument in the hands of Jesus Christ, to be at his disposal for the furtherance of his purposes, to be available wherever wanted for his service. Now, don't you want that? Don't you want to be available to God for whatever he wants to use you for? Isn't that a longing in your heart this morning? So I got to look at the story of Moses and see what lessons we can learn from this. So if you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Exodus 4, and um, God calls Moses to do this extraordinary job. He's to go back to Egypt and he's to lead the children of Israel out of slavery into the promised land. And actually, when we come to Christ, one of the things Christ involves us in is helping people to come out of slavery into freedom, because that's what salvation is. It's freedom. God wants to set people free. That's why Jesus came. I've come to set you free, he said. And uh, Moses, like most of us, comes up with various excuses as to why he couldn't possibly be asked to do this. So let's just look at the excuses. And the first excuse comes in verse 1. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? So the first excuse that Moses makes, and, and I have to say, I've got a lot of sympathy with him, is when, when I get back, they're going to say to me, the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord did not speak to you. Now just turn back in your Bible to chapter 3 and verse 18 to what God had already said to Moses. Look at verse 18. The elders of Israel, what does he say? Will listen to you. So God had already said to Moses, they will listen to you. And what does Moses say? Well, what happens if they don't listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Now, I want you to notice, this was a great problem to Moses, but it's not a great problem to God. And I want you to notice how God answers Moses' question. Have a look at it. He gives Moses three authenticating signs. What's the first sign? What's he got in his hand? He's got a staff, shepherd's staff. And what does God say to him? Throw the staff on the ground. Now Moses does what God says. And what happens to the staff? It becomes a snake. A poisonous snake. Now, can I say to you that I am absolutely sure it really did become a snake? There are some commentaries which say that this was a spiritual metaphor. Now, how a man is going to lead over two million people, and if you find two million a difficult number to think of, if you put them five abreast, in a line, that is a line over 110 miles long. That's how many people came out of Egypt. If you think that a man's going to lead a group like that with a spiritual metaphor in his hand, I tell you, you're living in cloud cuckoo land. So I'm absolutely sure it really did become a snake. And I'm absolutely sure that when he picked the snake up by the tail, it became a crook in his hand. So that was the first sign. What was the second sign? Put your hand into your cloak. He pulled it out. What was it covered in? Leprosy. Death. You're going to die, Moses. Put your hand back into the cloak, which he does, and he pulls it out, and what's happened? It's healed. So God has got power over death. That's the second sign. And the third sign, if they don't believe the first two signs, what's he to do? 
is to take some water from the Nile, which was God to the Egyptians, and he's to pour the water from the Nile onto the sand, and what would it, what would it become? Blood, in which no life could live. So God, the God of Abraham and Isaac, was more powerful than the gods of Egypt. Now, did that convince Moses? No. <laughs> and, and let's not be quick to judge him, because I think if we'd been in the same situation, I think we would have had a few good excuses up our sleeve. So what's the second excuse that Moses makes? Have a look at the text. Verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Now, the Hebrew, I don't know Hebrew, but I know where, like, I'm sure you know. Uh, I know where to look it up. Basically, Moses had a stutter or a stammer. And I'll tell you something, if you've got a stammer or a stutter, the thing you most dread is doing what I'm doing just now, which is speaking to people in public. Can you imagine the sheer horror of trying to lead two million people with a stutter. Now, I want you to notice how God answers his question. Look at verse 11. He says to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I? Now, now go, God says, and I will help you to speak, and I will teach you what to say. Now, does that convince Moses? Nope. <laughs> nope. Somebody here, who's, when I ask him a question, he goes, nope. <laughs> so what does he come up with the third, his third excuse? Now, this is the corker of all excuses. Look at it. Verse 13. Moses said, Oh Lord, please send someone else. Please don't ask me to do it. Now look at the next verse. Then the Lord's anger burnt against Moses. Now, I had to preach on this text. I was a curate at a church called All Souls Langham Place, where John Stock was the rector emeritus. I was a young man, I was about 26, a bit green behind the ears, and uh, there were many thousands of people who came to the church, it was a large church, and John Stock was often there. Often actually he was away in America or South America or Africa preaching. And um, I learned very early on, because my day off used to be on a Saturday, I learned that if I was going to have a decent day off, I had to have the sermon in the bag by Friday afternoon. If I didn't have the sermon, in the bag, I had a miserable day off. I was a young preacher, I was just getting going. Now I had, I read every commentary you could ever see on this passage, and I had no message. And it was Saturday night. And I remember standing in the sitting room, we lived in a little flat just below the GPO Tower, if you know London, the big GPO Tower. We lived right at the bottom, and I said to the Lord, Lord Jesus, Please, will you give me a message for the people? And then, to my horror, John Stock was going to be there. Normally he was away, I was hoping he'd be away. He was going to be there, and so I concluded him, and for John Stock as well. I think the Lord knew that John Stock was going to be there, but I just wanted to remind him. <laughs> and I went back to the text, and I looked at it again, and I noticed something very interesting in the text. And the thing that I noticed was verse 14. Have a look at it again. Then the Lord's anger burnt against Moses. And I knew that God is not easily angered. He's not like us. And so Moses said something which, was, which actually made God, the living God, angry. And I thought, this is really important. The writer 
is trying to tell us something very important. So I went back again and I looked at the excuses again and this is what I came up with and you can tell me afterwards whether you think I was correct or not. Now look, go back to the, to the first excuse. They will never believe me. Now what? What was the real excuse? That was the outward excuse. What was the real excuse? The real excuse, the real issue that Moses was struggling with, which I believe we all struggle with, was unbelief. He didn't believe God. He didn't believe God would be with him. He didn't believe they'd listen to him. And you know, we struggle with that. I struggle to believe that God is going to turn up when I pray for people. Do you struggle sometimes with that? I struggle to believe sometimes that God could possibly love me when I realise what I'm like. Do you know, the other day, I was driving into church in uh, where we live near Oxford, I burst into tears because I, we'd been away with the staff team and we'd been, people had been prophesying at the staff day over the different <coughs> members of the staff and some wonderful prophecies were shared and people were sharing words of encouragement and I thought yes that is partly true of me but there's an awful lot inside me of, that I don't like and that I don't love actually at all I find sometimes I'm very selfish and ir I can be irritable not with church people <coughs> with my wife <laughs> and I, I just started crying because I, I felt just repentant about the sin in my life and I'm sure you've had that experience I'm sure you've been broken you've been broken inside by God when he shows you what you're really like and it's painful I find it really painful as I'm telling you. Now, Moses didn't believe God. And, I, and that was a problem for Moses, but it's no problem for God, actually. And isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? It's not a problem to God. And I want you to notice how God answers that problem. What does he do? He says to Moses, Throw your crook on the ground. Now that's not difficult to do, is it? But the key thing is that Moses does what God says. He throws the crook on the ground, and then God tells him, and it becomes a snake. And then God tells him to do something a bit more difficult. When did you last pick a poisonous snake up by the tail? That's harder. But what I want you to notice is that Moses did what God told him. Picks the snake up by the tail and what happens to it? It becomes a crook. So Moses is learning early on, if you struggle with unbelief, and many of you do and I do, the best antidote to that is what? Obedience. Do what God tells you. Don't get into some big mind game with God. Do what he tells you. And if God tells you to do something, however simple, do it. And he'll tell you to do something a bit more difficult, I can promise you. Within a few months of that, he was holding that staff up over the Red Sea. And he had the Egyptian army bearing down on him. But he'd learned... If you obey God, God is with you. And you'll find that. If you obey God, and you, you do what he tells you, and you don't do what he tells you not to do, you will find you will grow in authority. Your faith will grow. That was the first problem. Now, what was the second problem? I'm no good at public speaking. What was he really saying? What was the issue behind that? 
The issue, I believe, was he felt inadequate. I'm inadequate. Imagine if you were appointed to be the evangelist of the north of England. That's about 18 million people. How would you feel about that? You'd probably feel how I did. I can't possibly do this. And the thing I want you to notice is that Moses actually became a fantastic preacher. Do you know that Josephus says he was the mightiest preacher in the Old Testament? Moses, the man with a stammer. Stephen, in Acts 7, describes Moses as mighty in word and in deed. Do you know, when I was a young man growing up in London, that one of the finest preachers in Britain was a vicar who had a stutter. God used this vicar all over the country. Do you remember the Apostle Paul? He went to God and he said, remember he had a thorn in his flesh? He asked God three times to get rid of the thorn and what did God say? My grace is made perfect in your weakness, not your strength, in your weakness. And I have discovered, I've been a clergyman now for about 30 years, 40 years, I've discovered that my weaknesses operate out of weakness. Your weakness, if you give it to God, will become your greatest strength. I can honestly tell you that. You don't need to tell people your strengths. They know them. Operate out of your weakness, out of vulnerability. It's far more effective. It's far more powerful than operating out of strength. Moses had to learn that. We have to learn that if we're going to be useful to God. And the third and final thing, there was only one excuse which actually made the living God angry, and that was what? When Moses said, sorry Lord, I'm not prepared to do it. You'll have to send somebody else. That made God angry. And if you want to make God angry, you won't make him angry because you struggle to believe in him. You won't even make him angry because you feel weak and ineffective and inadequate. That won't make him angry. The only thing that makes God angry is when somebody says, sorry God, sorry, sorry, no. I'm not going to do what you're calling me to do. Now eventually, as we know the story, Moses gave in. He took his staff, he went back to Jethro, he took his sons, and he headed off to Egypt, to a terrific adventure. Now about three or four weeks ago, I was up in Scotland visiting uh, uh, a lady who had given very, very generously to one of my sons works with Muslims, and she'd given to enable his work He's been running animation series on smartphones. They've already reached 150,000 Muslims with this app that he's produced. We went to say thank you, and I heard that my friend, who I told you about at the beginning, was very ill. Ray, he's called Ray Dunn. So I went to visit him in his little flat, and I could see he was very, very ill had cancer and it had spread and we talked together and uh, we joked about some of the great things. I could tell you so many amazing stories like when he introduced me to the biggest drug dealer in Scotland, he used to be the manager of the Bay City Rubble. I could tell you story after story. And I got back to Chipping Norton and I heard a week later he died. And hundreds of people turned up to his funeral because he had formerly been useless. But because he'd come to Christ, 
be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, he'd become really useful. People love him. And if you and I want to be really useful to God, don't worry about your, your struggles with unbelief. Don't worry about the struggles that you have of inadequacy. The only thing you need to worry about is when you say to God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God, I'm not available. God is not interested in your ability. He doesn't need your ability to do. He's God. What he needs is your availability. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you will help us, each one of us here, with all of the struggles that we have. We bring them to you. Help us to work out of weakness. Help us to obey you when you tell us to do things. And help us, Lord, to be available to you, to do whatever you want us to do. We give ourselves back to you in Jesus' name. Amen.